Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for sticking around. We like to say we saved the best for last, in our opinion. We have put together a phenomenal panel that's really going to give a nice overview uh, at some of the most interesting updates in neuroimaging that's really relevant to our specialty. We have three leaders in the field that are going to talk about very different topics, so we'll keep everyone engaged. I'm going to introduce our panelists, and please know that we are going to take all questions at the end, so I'll go ahead and introduce everyone at the onset. First um, is Dr. Matt Amons. He is an associate professor at UCSF, where he also serves as the director of the Neurointerventional Fellowship, and he is also the director of the Pulsatile Tinnitus Clinic at UCSF. He does some great work in the innovative um, aspects of neuroimaging in the lab. And uh, he will be talking about pulsatile tinnitus, of course. Then is Dr. Uh, Jason Allen, who is um, an MD-PhD in neuroscience, and he did his residencies in neurology and radiology, were then followed by a two-year neuroradiology fellowship. He's currently the director of the neuroradiology division at Emory where I get to work with him. And uh, he is also the medical director of the Laboratory for Imaging Neurosciences at Emory and is an associate professor with uh, appointments in radiology, neurology, and biomedical engineering. So he has some uh, very interesting work where he's defining the human vestibular network through functional imaging. And finally, but not least, Dr. Ali Sapodari, so he is currently at the Scripps Clinic in San Diego, but he was previously at UCLA, and he is really the leading in the American effort on Meniere's imaging. So I'm very excited to hear all of you. Inviting me to speak with you all today. My name is Matt Amons. I am a neurointerventional radiologist at the University of California, San Francisco, and I'm the director of the UCSF Pulsatile Tinnitus Clinic, which is our multidisciplinary clinic to improve diagnosis and treat patients with pulsatile tinnitus, and also to do research uh, through the UCSF Cerebral Venous Disorders Lab. And I've been invited to come and discuss what's new in pulsatile tinnitus. These are my disclosures. And I thought I'd focus my talk today on venous sinus stenting for IIH, advanced blood flow visualization tools, 3D printed models, and the phonocatheter. Going right into IIH, we all know idiopathic intracranial hypertension is a pathological elevation in intracranial pressure that can cause blindness, headaches, or debilitating pulsatile tinnitus. It commonly occurs in overweight women of childbearing age. And in this patient cohort, has an incidence of 22 out of 100,000. Transverse sinus stenoses have recently been understood to be critical to the pathophysiology of IIH. A focal stenosis is seen in 93% of patients with IIH as opposed to 6.8% of controls. Lowering the intracranial pressure resolves the transverse sinus stenosis. And resolving the stenosis with a venous sinus stent also lowers the intracranial pressure. These are the big dural venous sinuses that we're talking about. The superior sagittal sinus drains into the torcula, which then splits into the patient's right and left transverse sinus, goes down to the sigmoid sinus and exits the skull through the jugular veins. And these patients develop stenoses at the lateral margins of the transverse sinuses. The veins still have to do their job returning the blood flow from the, the brain so pressure builds up in these venous sinuses in order to overcome the stenoses and return the blood flow to the heart. Here is a typical MR venogram showing the stenoses gaps in the venous sinuses laterally. This is the pathophysiology. Elevated intracranial pressure leads to transverse sinus stenoses in the lateral margins of the transverse sinuses probably because of some inherent weakness in the structure at that location. And this causes venous sinus obstruction, which elevates the venous pressure. The cerebral spinal fluid is reabsorbed into the dural venous sinuses, but that requires a CSF 
to venous pressure gradient in order to facilitate the fluid flow into the veins. So elevating the venous pressure decreases the gradient between the cerebral spinal fluid pressure and the venous pressure. It elevates the venous pressure, so the difference is diminished, which leads to decreased CSF reabsorption or decreased CSF absorption. And that further causes elevated intracranial pressures and then propagates this positive feedback loop, which is the pathophysiology of IIH. There are several different treatments. Conservative therapy, which is diamoxin weight loss, is the mainstay of therapy. And that probably works to decrease the cerebral spinal fluid production. Shunting uh, is the probably old school surgical therapy of choice that immediately causes CSF absorption. And venous sinus stenting is the newer treatment on the block. This targets transverse sinus stenosis relieves the venous obstruction and brings the venous pressure to normal, allowing the body to reabsorb the fluid immediately. There's been a recently published meta-analysis looking at the different surgical therapies to treat IIH, uh, and this is sort of a table summarizing the results of this manuscript. Venous science denting uh, has been evaluated in over 825 patients now, making it the most heavily researched surgical intervention for IIH. And we see that it has an efficacy for papilledema of nearly 90% with very low complication rates, 2.3% uh, risk of subdural hemorrhage, most of which uh, is well tolerated. And there is a stent failure rate of about 13%. So 13% require a second venous sinus stenting procedure. The majority of these fail within the first year. When we compare that to uh, shunting, there's a 40% failure rate of uh, shunts getting clogged, et cetera. Uh, and this can happen at any point in time over the course of the patient's life. With venous sinus stenting, the majority of stent failures happen within the first six months. So when we get outside of a year, patients are typically cured. In terms of the other um, symptoms that we're targeting, for papilledema, we see it's it's probably among the most effective treatment, seems to be the most effective treatment for improving patients' visual fields, uh, as well as their headaches. But what about pulsatile tinnitus? It turns out venous sinus stenting is 95% effective in curing pulsatile tinnitus in patients with IIH, as per this recently published meta-analysis. And this is an image uh, from a recent stenting procedure I did. This is, patient had a very long uh, area of stenosis involving the posterior aspect of the superior sagittal sinus as well as the transverse sinus. So this is a complex construct of several overlapping stents uh, throughout the venous system, uh, but this cured the patient's underlying pulsal tinnitus as well as her papilledema. So that's venous sinus stenting, a more recently developed treatment that seems to be quite effective in curing pulsal tinnitus in patients with IAH. Let's talk now about blood flow visualization. This is a zoomed in picture, uh, sagittal MRI image. This is the transverse sinus in a patient and here is a uh, transverse sinus stenosis. Just downstream from that, you can see this sigmoid sinus diverticulum projecting anteriorly in this patient or a uh, sinus, sigmoid sinus wall defect as it some, is sometimes termed. We can measure the blood flow going into the transverse sinus and use that to develop a computational model that allows us to visualize the blood flow in these patients. That's called computational fluid dynamics. And so what we see here is a jet of high velocity blood flow going through the stenosis that then uh, directs directly into this patient's sigmoid sinus diverticulum, suggesting that the flow jet here caused by the stenosis is what actually causes the sigmoid sinus wall defect in these patients. So computational fluid dynamics uh, is a computational model that we can create using the patient's anatomy and obtaining the inflow blood, blood flow parameters using MRI. 4D flow is another technique that directly visualizes the velocity of blood flow across the cardiac cycle in the dural venous sinuses. And so in the same patient, you can see the high jet, uh, high velocity flow jet through the stenosis directed directly into this patient's sigmoid sinus diverticulum. So computational fluid dynamics is a computer model 
And 4D flow is direct in vivo measuring of the velocity across time using MRI. And we can use this to look at the blood flow in patients who have postural tennis. So in this manuscript, we compared uh, blood flow in the jugular vein in several patients without pulsatile tennis to the blood flow in the jugular vein in several patients with pulsatile tennis. And those with pulsatile tennis had this very conspicuous helix of blood flow that forms within the jugular vein uh, that was absent in the control patients. So again, this is computational models that are made derived from the anatomic imaging of the MRI and measuring the overall bulk flow going into uh, the vein and then calculating the flow. So computational fluid dynamics are computer simulations that can be used to further define the hemodynamic parameters in patients' blood vessels who have pulsatile tennis. And let's look at 4D flow MRI. This is a patient who has a brain aneurysm and we're using 4D flow to look at the velocity uh, and, and these are the path lines of blood flow through this patient's aneurysm. And we can use the same technology and look at blood flow using MRI in the patients who had pulsatile tennis. So here we took several patients. Uh, the ones on the left are patients without pulsatile tennis and those on the right are with pulsatile tennis. These are the sigmoid sinuses going down into the jugular veins of several different patients. And we've arranged them so that they're increasing height of the jugular vein as we go to the right of the jugular bulb and increased diameter of the jugular bulb as we go to the right. And we looked at the blood flow in these patients and you can see that in those without pulsatile tennis on the left side here, there's really pretty smooth transition of flow from the sigmoid sinus going down into the jugular vein. And those with pulsatile tennis, uh, this helix of blood flow, helical pattern starts to show up within the jugular vein and we can further segment this out into the peripheral helical pattern and the center core helix of blood flow. And from that, we can derive several different parameters to better characterize the underlying hemodynamics uh, in these patients that may be responsible for pulsatile tennis. So we have 4D flow that allows for direct in vivo measurement of blood flow in pulsatile tennis patients. We can also print out models, uh, 3D printed models of patient specific anatomy, attach them to a flow circuit, the models to a flow circuit that is set up to push a blood analog at the same velocity and rate, uh, heart rate as the patients. Uh, and then we can inject dye as we're doing in this video to prove that the um, results of the 4D flow and CFD are accurate. So you can see the center core helical pattern starting to form in this dye dilutional video of a 3D printed patient specific model. You can also use these techniques to see what changes in the blood flow when patients' pulsatile tinnitus resolves. So in this study, we took patients who had IIH that we thought was causing their pulsatile tinnitus. And we know that when we do a lumbar puncture that removes a large volume of cerebrospinal fluid and drive the pressure down in these patients, their pulsatile tinnitus often goes away. So we took a, several of these patients and we had them rate their pulsatile tinnitus on a scale of one to 10. We did anatomic imaging in an MR and we did the 4D flow, uh, blood flow imaging to look at the blood flow uh, in the veins, in the transverse sinuses and sigmoid sinuses. While they were in the magnet, we did a MR guided lumbar puncture, drove down the pressure. Most patients' pulsatile tinnitus completely resolved. And then we repeated the anatomical and flow imaging. Uh, so we can see what changes when patient sound goes away. And this is the, just to orient people, this is the transverse sinus and the transverse sinus stenosis. This is the sigmoid sinus. This is the usual location of the sigmoid wall defect in these patients. And you can see there's this high velocity flow jet of blood flow that's present pre-LP that essentially resolves post lumbar puncture. Uh, so the, the, the jet of blood flow is markedly diminished and that correlates with the diminishing symptoms. This is uh, basically the, the velocity of blood flow along the center line of the vein. And you can see the pre-lumbar puncture velocities are in red, post-lumbar puncture are in blue. And so the velocity at the same location where the area of stenosis is uh, slows down. Anatomically, what happens is 
pre-lumbar puncture, there's a stenosis that essentially immediately resolves in these patients when we lower the pressure. So 4D flow is a tool that we can use to analyze the blood flow in these patients in vivo using MRI, both when they are symptomatic and are not symptomatic, and we can identify what hemodynamic parameters change. What it doesn't tell us is if that actually makes sound. For that, we're using 3D printed uh, models of patients' blood vessels. So we have a wax model of this patient's transverse sinus to orient everyone. This is the transverse sinus, sigmoid sinus, and jugular vein. And so we printed out a model in this patient who has a stenosis and a sigmoid sinus diverticulum in this blue wax, which we then embed in a plastic fixture. The wax has a lower melting temperature than the fixture, so we put it in a warm bath. We end up with a hollow model that we can hook up to our flow circuit and we can use a Bluetooth enabled stethoscope to listen to it and record sounds. So we have a pre lumbar puncture model with a stenosis, a post lumbar puncture model with no stenosis that you can see here. And we hook it up to the same flow circuit and we listen. And this is the sound recorded from the pre lumbar puncture model. And this is the sound from the post lumbar puncture model. Uh, there's no sound. So we can use 3D printed models to actually generate pulse wall tennis sounds. Here's a graph of the sounds being generated, pre-lumbar puncture on your left, post-lumbar puncture on the right. We can also use these models to help identify which anatomical abnormality is causing sound, particularly when there's multiple. So this patient has a stenosis and a diverticulum. Which one's causing sound is often a difficult question to answer. So we print out a model without the stenosis, but still has the diverticulum. And obviously, you know, the, the post lumbar puncture resolved stenosis had no sound. So the diverticulum is not generating the sound in this patient. The sound is being generated by the stenosis, not the diverticulum. So we can use these 3D printed models to hear pulse tennis sounds and prove the anatomical cause in patients who have multiple sound, multiple potential causes. Our labs also developed an endovascular microphone that you can see here. It's basically a sound transducer embedded in the tip of a catheter here. And we are putting it in the models. You can see pre-lumbar puncture and post-lumbar puncture. Uh, here's the catheter within the model. And we're pushing our blood flow analog through it. We're recording sounds from outside of the model using the stethoscope and inside of the model using the phonocatheter. And you can see the results uh, between the stethoscope on the top closely match the results from the phonocatheter underneath. Uh, so this is a newly developed tool that's currently being worked on in my lab, the phonocath, uh, which is the development of an endovascular microphone. So to recap, what's new in pulse flow tennis? Well, venous sinus stenting is incredibly effective at treating IIH patients who have pulse flow tennis. We have advanced blood flow imaging techniques now to look at the, the, the hemodynamics in the veins or arteries that may be causing uh, patients' pulse tennis. We can build 3D printed patient-specific models and push a blood analog through it that can actually generate sound. And we have a uh, endovascular microphone that is under development currently. So I'll wrap it up and thank you for your future questions. Please feel free to email me as well if you're interested in, in greater depth of discussion or potentially collaborating. Hi, I'm Ali Sepadari from Scripps Clinics and Hospitals in San Diego. I'll be talking about imaging of Meniere's disease. I'd like to thank Dr. Sharon and the rest of the committee for inviting me to speak to you today, and I hope I'm able to show you something. My disclosures uh, include consulting with Spiral Therapeutics, I'll also be discussing off-label use of gadolinium-based contrast agent, both discussing route of administration and intravenous dosing. I'd like to also acknowledge collaborators from UCLA, where I was prior to coming to Scripps. Most of the images that I'm going to show you come from my time at UCLA, working very closely with Dr. Zishiyama, as well as with our team of MRI technologists at the MRI Research Center at UCLA. Uh, a little background, as you all know, lymphatic hydrops is the primary pathologic alteration in Meniere's disease. This is discovered through uh, autopsy studies of human temporal bones. And historically, with imaging, 
most imaging had been focused on looking at the vestibular aqueduct, with the theory being that impaired longitudinal flow through the vestibular aqueduct was the mechanism of high drops. With conventional tomography, and then with computed tomography, or CT as we call it, there was the, the beginning of the ability to actually look at the vestibular aqueduct. This led to really a series of papers looking at the caliber of the vestibular aqueduct or at uh, maybe surrounding sclerosis. And it took a little bit of a while, but eventually everybody realized that there really wasn't much information to be obtained uh, from this method. And so for a while, imaging of Meniere's disease kind of went dormant after some initial interest. With the development of MRI and advancements in MRI technology, uh, what we discovered was that we actually had the ability to distinguish perilymph from endolymph with high resolution images uh, with very high contrast if we did certain maneuvers. Now the first technique that was used was to inject contrast into the middle ear cavity. This is a very small amount of contrast, just a couple of drops diluted in saline, injected through the tympanic membrane using a tuberculin syringe. Patient would lie with the uh, injected side up for one hour and that would allow the contrast to sit against the round window would diffuse through the round window into the perilymph, and then they would be brought back the next day, uh, 24 hours later, for a scan. And these are just a series of images showing you how you can identify the bright perilymph in the vestibule surrounding the dark endolymph, and there's tight junctions that separate perilymph from endolymph. This is how the separate chemical environments can be maintained so that action potentials can be formed across the uh, inner hair cells in response to organ of corti uh, tictorial membrane deflection. These are a series of images, T1, 2D flare, and 3D flare, showing increasing spatial resolution and increasing contrast resolution between endolymph and perilymph. Now, that's a very invasive method to inject contrast into somebody's uh, middle ear cavity, and so uh, what was then shortly after discovered was that you could achieve a similar effect simply with an intravenous contrast injection and with a single day protocol. Now this is a double dose of contrast, so twice what the normal uh, recommended manufacturer dose is, that's an off-label use, and then four hours later bring the patient back for a scan. This is a 3D flare sequence and the contrast has diffused into the perilymph but is not gotten into the endolymph because there's no active transport of the contrast into the endolymph and it's not able to diffuse across those tight junctions. And in this case, you can see the uh, dark uh, endolymph in the vestibule, that's the utricle that you're looking at, surrounded by bright perilymph. I'm gonna put my pointer on it. This is the utricle surrounded by bright perilymph. These images can be obtained consistently and they do show you that you're able to distinguish endolymph from perilymph. I'm going to now show you some clinical examples of it. These images, while they show proof of concept, are not quite as high resolution as what we need. And so I'm now going to show you some specialized images that require some uh, modifications to the MRI protocol that let you see some of these things with more detail. Now I'm going to show you some clinical examples of higher resolution high drops images. I'm going to start by showing you the standard cisternographic T2. And we're going to zoom up here onto the inner ear so we can uh, get a lay of land for the normal anatomy. Going from superior to inferior, this is the superior semicircular canal. This is the vestibule. You can faintly see a hypointensity in the center of the vestibule. That's the utricle. You can see the beginnings of the cochlea. As you go further down, you get to the cochlear basal turn. And if you look hard, you can see faintly this hypointense line, which is the spiral osseous lamina. Now I'm going to show you a, uh, a 3D T2 flare image four hours after a double dose of intravenous contrast. And this is a T2 flare image that has been modified to really enhance uh, the effect that we're looking for, which is the T1 shortening effect of the uh, contrast that was administered and that has diffused into the perilymph, but not the endolymph. We're gonna start from the same location. So this is the top of the superior semicircular canal. It's the uh, anterior limb and the uh, posterior limb. And as we go down, we get into the uh, vestibule and the utricle is dark and then the surrounding perilymph is bright and we can see the cochlea as well. As we scroll further down, we get into the same basal turn of the cochlea. And again, if you look hard, you can see the spiral osseous lamina faintly. And this is a normal left 
uh, inner ear. I'm going to now show you the abnormal side. We're going to go over here to the right side. Again, star from above, we see the superior semicircular canal. As we come down, we see the uh, vestibule, and the utricle is a little bit enlarged compared to what we saw on the uh, left side. A little bit enlarged, a little bit difficult to detect, though. As we go further down, however, the normal saccule is going to be imperceptibly small, and you're not really going to see anything in the anterior inferior portion of the vestibule. However, on the affected side, the perilymph in that space is effaced. Furthermore, when we look at the cochlea, we see a little bit of extra dark signal in the scale of vestibuli compartment because when there's cochlear hydrops, uh, that's the area where the bulging occurs. There's a uh, um, compliance across Reisner's membrane where there is not compliance across the spiral osseous lamina. And so you'll see dark signal facing the normal bright signal in the scale of vestibuli. Now these uh, images are a little bit difficult to interpret because they're very noisy and the dark endolymph has very similar appearance as the dark bone. So it's difficult to feel confident when you're interpreting those images. However, we are able to do some maneuvers and create subtracted images where the abnormalities are much more apparent. In these images, the perilymph is bright, the endolymph is dark, and the surrounding bone is a medium gray. As we go from superior to inferior, we see the superior semicircular canal. As we go further down, this is the utricle, again, a little bit dilated, uh, dark signal. As we go further inferiorly, we see the enlarged saccule, and it's very easily distinguished from adjacent bone with the benefit of these subtracted images. As we go further down, you can see the cochlea and this very subtle cochlear hydrops where there's a little bit of extra dark signal facing the scale of vestibular compartment. So this is an example of mild cochlear hydrops, really minimal, and hydrops involving the saccule. There is uh, one additional finding which uh, can be detected, which is that there is increased signal within the perilymph on the affected side compared to the unaffected side. This is due to impairment of the blood labyrinth barrier with excess leakage of contrast. Uh, and this is a separate pathologic process that is co-occurring with high drops. And we see this in a certain percentage of cases, about 30 to 50% of cases in my experience. Uh, we don't always see it. Sometimes in a patient with clinical Meniere's disease, they don't show high drops, but they do show this permeability asymmetry finding. It can be subtle and a little bit difficult to detect. However, uh, if you measure it with a Hounsfield unit calipers, you can tell. Or if you do a maximum intensity projection image, uh, that finding can stand out a little bit more. With a maximum intensity projection image, you also get to see everything all in one shot and you can see the effacement of the vestibular endolymph a little bit more uh, convincingly. I'd like to show one final example to give you a sense of the uh, range of imaging appearances. I'm gonna go straight to the subtracted images in this case, where again, perilymph is bright, endolymph is dark, and surrounding bone is medium gray. I'm gonna zoom up on the left ear, and we're gonna start from superior to inferior, normal superior semicircular canal, bright signal. As we go inferiorly, what we see is a grossly dilated utricle. I'm gonna draw your attention to the normal right side. The normal utricle should have at least some perilymph surrounding it. In this case, the utricle is so dilated that it's contacting the uh, walls of the bony labyrinth, uh, partially herniating into the ampulla of the lateral canal and completely filling the vestibule at the level of the lateral canal. As we go inferiorly, we see a dilated saccule also completely filling the anterior inferior portion of the vestibule. Compare that to the normal right side. And then as we look at the cochlea, we see grossly dilated cochlear duct completely effacing the perilymph in the scale of vestibuli. And we can compare that to the normal contralateral right side. This patient also did have a permeability asymmetry that was relatively mild, but was measurable. This is an example of uh, high drops involving all three structures that we look at, utricle, saccule, cochlea, also with permeability asymmetry, essentially the most severe form of high drops that we're able to visualize. I've shown you these nice images. However, there are some limitations. There is significant technique dependence in image acquisition. The base sequence is going to be either a 3D flare or a 3D phase-sensitive inversion recovery, also known as real IR uh, from some vendors.
However, this requires some modifications to the technique that not every uh, MRI center is capable of and requires a certain amount of technical know-how among the part of the MRI staff. Furthermore, there's non-standard criteria for interpreting and reporting these studies. In the literature, the rate of high drops in patients with clinical diagnosis of definite MD is anywhere from 50 to 95 percent. That reflects variation both in image acquisition technique and in reporting strategy. Contralateral high drops in an asymptomatic ear has been reported anywhere from 0 to 65 percent of the time. It's an eye-popping range and I think is reflective of significant variation in how these studies are acquired and reported. There are some clinical applications to this, but they're limited at this moment. Right now, I think the only legitimate clinical application is to use as an adjunct to a clinical diagnosis of Meniere's. That's because the state of the literature is predominantly backwards looking in this. Take patients with known clinical Meniere's disease, image them this way, and we show, not unexpectedly, that most of them show high drops. Therefore, if you have a patient who is maybe on the fence about a treatment that you want to offer, Having these images may help uh, with patient counseling and help them to buy into whatever the treatment is. There is, I think, more excitement for what the future may hold. It may improve our understanding of the disease process. It may have prognostic value in people who have Meniere's-like symptoms but without uh, all of the criteria for the disease. It may help in identifying different imaging phenotypes that actually reflect different disease processes that may help target treatments. And it may provide a marker of disease activity. As a little bit of a teaser for what it is that we're able to see, this is a paper that uh, we wrote about five years ago. A couple of patients had a partial or complete high drops reversal with treatment. This is one example. This was a patient who uh, developed a classic Meniere syndrome, uh, had pretreatment images showing vestibular and cochlear high drops. With treatment, both of these resolved. The patient stopped taking his diuretics, his symptoms recurred and follow-up imaging showed recurrence of the high drops in the vestibule. There may also be prognostic value in patients with atypical Meniere's-like symptoms. This is a busy chart from a recent paper, so I'm just going to call your attention. Look at any gray or black bars. On the right side of the image, patients with clinical Meniere's disease had a lot of high drops. That's what the gray and black bars are. Patients with Meniere's-like symptoms but not meeting all the criteria for such a diagnosis had high drops in some cases, though not to the same extent as those with Meniere's. Patients with idiopathic sudden sensorineural hearing loss had no significant high drops. It was diagnosed as mild in about 20% of cases. This may be overcall, these may just actually be normals. But you can see that among these patients with the Meniere's-like symptoms, some of them had high drops. And those patients, we have to see how they do, but they may have a different clinical course from those without high drops. There are other applications of this imaging to non meniere uh, uses. Patients with otosclerosis, semicircular canal dehiscence, and vestibular schwannoma have all been shown to have high drops by this technique from multiple investigators. Now, as to what this means, at least one group found that patients with otosclerosis who showed high drops uh, had problems after their surgery in some cases. It was a prolonged bout of dizziness afterwards which may have been due to producing a rupture in the uh, endolymph during the stapedectomy. We don't know yet how it may affect patients with semicircular canal dehiscence or vestibular schwannoma, but it may give us some idea of if a patient has hearing loss with a vestibular schwannoma, perhaps their hearing loss is in fact mediated through high drops rather than through something else that's happening downstream in the nerve, and that may affect how you counsel a patient. So in summary, we're in the middle of a rapid expansion of imaging of endolymphatic high drops using MRI. The highest quality imaging is not yet widely available, so please proceed with caution if you want to try to implement this where you are. And at the current time, it's not yet clear what actionable information is available with high drops MRI, but we're very hopeful that we'll be able to do more for patients with these more powerful tools. Thank you very much for your time. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Allen from Emory University and I would like to uh, begin by thanking Esther and Jeff as well as the ANS for uh, inviting me to give this talk as well as to everyone to staying along for the, the final talk of the session. So I'm going to be uh, changing gears here a bit and talking about functional imaging of uh, central vestibular disorders. So we're going to be looking at 
uh, MRI uh, intracranially as opposed to um, some of the um, external things that we've looked at so far. Um, that's just my disclosures, just some grants, and we'll talk a little bit about some of my own research, and I do some consulting that's not important for this talk. So to begin with, um, we need to understand a little bit about functional MRI, and I put this slide up only because I just wanted to shoot fear into everybody's heart to see a bunch of equations that uh, even most radiologists probably don't understand. So moving, moving away from that, instead, I just need to give a basis of how functional MRI actually works so you can understand um, some of the data I'm going to be showing in case you're not familiar with it. Basically, you see on the left there, uh, functional MRI uh, takes neuronal activity and changes it across what we actually image as cerebral blood flow. And so we're not really you know, seeing the neural activity itself, but instead the changes in cerebral blood flow regionally that are kind of reflecting the, uh, the, the changes in neuronal activity. <clears throat> and you can see, I'm not going to get into the physics much, but you can see at rest uh, when not much is happening, we have a certain amount of blood flow coming in and a certain amount of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. And the deoxygenated blood has some paramagnetic effects um, that decrease signal while the oxygenated blood increases the signal. And once the activity starts happening, so neurons start firing, um, mod modulated through astrocytes, we get a dilatation of the blood vessel and more oxygenated blood flows in and uh, brings more signal with it. And that's actually what we're seeing when we do an fMRI experiment. And you can see here just on the left, um, showing this more graphically that uh, the baseline, uh, we have some signal that um, we can skip the middle, but in the bottom side, you see you have this increased signal when the, uh, we have this reactive hyperemia, and that's what we're looking at during uh, an examination. For a task-based fMRI, uh, one of the things we'll be talking about is where the patient will actually do some sort of task in the scanner, and uh, we usually do this in block design where we have them do the task, and then we have them not do the task. And over time, uh, we do this a number of times, we can see areas that light up mostly during the tasks that we're interested in, as you can see in this finger tapping experiment in the um, right side of the, uh, uh, around the uh, central sulcus. Conversely, we do something called resting state fMRI, and in that the patients sit at rest, as the name implies, in the scanner, and generally just look at a, a plus sign with their eyes open or occasionally with their eyes closed. And we just look to see what the brain does and in, in regionally uh, across the entire brain. And when areas of the brain are in um, together in synchronicity and they are firing kind of at the same time or the blood flow changes are at the same time, we can assume that those areas are um, connected functionally. It's been shown with EEG and MEG that these reflect very well um, known um, circuitry in the brain. So now we're just going to move on to describing a little bit of the vestibular cortex. And interesting enough, it's only been recently that we started to understand the human vestibular cortex. For the monkey, it's been well defined that this area you can see labeled the parietoinsular vestibular cortex uh, is the actual uh, primary vestibular cortex in, in the monkey. But there's lots of other areas that we know from uh, lesional experiments and activation experiments feed into that region and provide input or output. In the human, uh, the analog would be this area that I have highlighted in red here. That would be the uh, PIVC. So there was a very nice uh, meta-analysis study done uh, several years ago looking at task fMRI cases where they either stimulated um, the vestibular system calorically, as you can see in figure A there on the lower left corner, and you can see the blue activation, or non-calorically where you can see the activation they found in the red. And I, I don't need to tell this audience um, how, how this might be done with um, caloric or non-caloric uh, methods. Then when they did an actual overlap to see which areas were both activated during caloric stimulation and non-caloric stimulation, you can see this region deep in the uh, posterior insula called OP2 and it's adjacent OP1. Those were the areas that um, overcame both activated in both tasks, suggesting that this was the primary vestibular cortex in the human. And this lo localizes uh, in that region of the PIVC that you can see in the right upper figure in red. And then just interesting enough, like language, uh, as many of you may know, uh, is lateralized to one side of the brain that we generally call the dominant hemisphere. There is a, quote, dominant hemisphere for um, vestibular activation as well, although it localizes to the contralateral side from language. So you can see in that lower right-hand corner in work by Kirsch et al, that um, when a right-hander has activation, we get activation uh, in the right vestibular uh, region there, vestibular cortex, and conversely on the left. So we have the PIVC, that's that central area. And, and uh, further work by Brandt et al has hypothesized an area called the multisensory orientation region, which kind of surrounds the PIVC. 
and gets inputs from the uh, visual system, as you would imagine, a lot of visual input is uh, required to know where your head is in space, and also from flammic input, and that's inputs coming up from below, from the actual end organs. And these process into this region, um, and uh, including the PIVC, to give some uh, baseline vestibular processing. And there's another area I'd like to point out that's important for vestibular processing located more anteriorly. And this was shown in work about six years ago by Adela Justina and her group, where they uh, gave patients a task fMRI, giving them a visual checkerboard stimulus. And you can see that that top row there on the right-hand side, then vestibular stimulus. And we see different areas of the brain lighting up. And then when they did simultaneous visual and vestibular stimuli, you can see a couple areas of the brain light up most importantly in the regions of the right middle and inferior frontal gyri. You can see in that uh, left-hand figure, um, the bottom uh, part of that right-hand figure, excuse me. And so to kind of summarize, we have that central area, uh, which we're gonna call the PIVC. It's surrounded by the MSO or multi-sensory orientation zone where we're starting to get the kind of first order of processing. And then also important to know is the VVMCZ or that visual vestibular multi-sensory conversion zone, which is a mouthful, but it's located more anteriorly, which is also important in visual vestibular processing. So make it more graphically, just briefly, we have the labyrinth bodies that, and through the cranial nerve eight, which I'm all, you're all well familiar with, bring in inputs into the vestibular nuclei and the brainstem. And these ascend into the thalami bilaterally. And from there, that, uh, that kind of primary input goes out to the PIVC in the region of that MSO, that multi-sensory orientation zone. And then we have inputs in and out of this region from a lot of different areas, that VVMCZ we just talked about, um, also the frontal eye fields. Uh, MTV5 is a, uh, um, a higher visual um, processing center. And then the posterior hippocampus, which is important in, in um, spatial memory. So this was a great uh, recent paper from last year by Innovina and her group. And what they looked at was taking out the modularity of resting state fMRI. And if you're not familiar with modularity, it's just basically how well different regions of the brain work together in a unified network or a unified whole. And I'm just gonna point your attention to the right-hand figure where you can see the region of the PIVC, that's what I've highlighted there in red, as well as the MSO, that surrounding area, and the VVMCZ more anteriorly, they're all um, pictured there in green because they act kind of as a functional, functional unit. And that is what we can kind of consider the really basis for the vestibular system is, is right there. Obviously there are other parts that are important that are shown in different colors here. And there's a contralateral side as well. Although again, there's dominance and that's why we can see the thing uh, more prominently on the right. This is just showing that if you see that area that um, PIVC or OP2 that you get uh, kind of connections throughout the brain. So there are a lot of inputs and outputs that are involved in visual vestibular processing. This is another recent paper by uh, Riser's group uh, from last year. And basically they tried to correlate back to the monkey uh, non-human primate homologue to see if we could find similar vestibular pathways that were known in, in uh, those animals in humans. And I'm not gonna belabor this point, but some of these areas you can see OP2 there in the right hand figure. Those are the upper right hand is the functional connectivity. But a lot of other areas are providing inputs and outputs into the vestibular system. So it's a very complex system that uh, is uh, multi-sensory. And the bottom is just showing that a lot of these areas where it says SCVN, that's structural connectivity, and that these are actually linked together um, with streamlines or presumed axonal connections. So that brings us to vestibular disorders. So uh, we have, of course, peripheral disorders, and then there are central disorders, which um, may be less uh, known to some of the audience. Um, I've, on the prefer peripheral ones, we're gonna go through a couple of these, um, but I'm also include, not on this list, is post-traumatic vestibular dysfunction, which is actually the area of my uh, interest. So begin with vestibular neuritis, there's been some interesting work uh, on acute vestibular neuritis. You can see here by this paper by Helmkin and, and uh, their group that, uh, not to be too confusing, but if you look on that, figure on the left showing the, the heat map that's from red and yellow. That is patients who have left-sided vestibular, acute vestibular neuritis. And this is one of the components we can pull out, one of the connected regions or networks um, that you, you can see in, in the patients, not just restricted to those who have vestibular neuritis, but if you shift to the right-hand part B figure, you can see that area marked contralateral intraparietal sulcus. And what it's showing here is that that region of the brain is hyper-connected or more connected back to the rest of this visual vestibular network in patients who have acute vestibular neuritis. So even acutely, we can already see changes in functional connectivity in the brain. 
And you can see here um, that the degree of that connectivity back to that more vestibular network uh, is a, um, a function related to their, their VADL, so their vestibular symptomatology. And then in group A, the patients, those are patients scanned at two different times, the triangle and the circles. And it, in group A, you can see those patients did not recover. And in those patients, they had that persistent increased connectivity in that region. Whereas in group B, patients who did recover, um, that wasn't as pronounced. We can also see um, changes related to more uh, chronic vestibular neuritis, which is uh, shown here in the right-hand figure. Um, this is just uh, a figure showing areas that uh, when you have concurrent visual and vestibular stimulation in the magnet doing a task fMRI, that this area of V1, you can see on the right-hand side, that little yellow dot is um, selectively lighting up in patients who have uh, chronic vestibular neuritis compared to con controls. And um, that was a marker of um, disease. And that also that area of activation, the, the amount of activation we see in that area, the amount of increased blood flow was directly correlated to several uh, vestibular symptoms, including dizziness, handicap, inventory, and, and the vertigo symptom scale. And this is just showing it kind of graphically. Now moving on to vestibular migraine, which is very interesting. Uh, for this group, I probably don't need to go over the criteria for vestibular migraine, but here they are listed on the left. But in a uh, patients with vestibular migraine doing a <clears throat> task fMRI, what they found was uh, in comparison to controls, there was this region in the thalamus um, on the left, the left medial dorsal thalamus, that selectively um, had increased blood flow in, in patients who had vestibular migraine. Um, and this was data taken not during their vestibular migraine, uh, which is obviously hard to image patients, but uh, in their interictal period. And you can see that uh, degree of activation, probably easiest to look on the bottom right-hand figure, uh, C. The amount of activation in the thalamus was directly correlated to how many attacks those patients had, um, uh, how many days per month of vestibular migraine they had. And uh, indicating that this is an area that may be intri intricately involved in um, uh, progression of the migraine. So there's been a, a lot of other nice work. This is a very recent paper by Chen's group from this year where they looked at uh, functional connectivity and areas of uh, seating the left or right thalamus. And what I basically want you to focus here is on the lower part of the screen where we have, it says decreased functional connectivity. So there were areas where we had less connectivity in patients and had vestibular migraine than controls, particularly between the right thalamus and the left insula, which is an area of multimodal uh, sensory processing and the left anterior cingulate uh, cortex, and the left thalamus with the left ACC and the, and the bilateral insula. And then you can see there were also areas of increased functional connectivity. So similar to those other areas, I, uh, papers I showed you where we had increased functional activity in those regions. Here, the actual connectivity between the right thalamus and then again, the right superior parietal lobule, kind of near that um, interparietal sulcus we talked about as well as from the left thalamus to the right middle frontal gyrus. And just to point out some of these areas, uh, those in green are uh, thalamal pain pathways that are involved in vestibular migraine, not surprisingly. The blue ones I highlighted there is a thalamal visual pathway um, that goes back to that IPS that we saw previously. And then again, the left thalamus to the right middle frontal gyrus, that's one of the thalamal vestibular pathways. So we've got a combination of all of these occurring um, changes in their functional organization in patients with vestibular migraine. Uh, the upper left-hand corner here by Z's group is just showing that there was some uh, cortical uh, volume loss in the PIVC on the left um, that was correlated with um, uh, vestibular migraines. And if you see that region, um, you can see that there was decrease, excuse me, increased connectivity to the um, uh, superior parietal region near the, um, uh, on the left um, in those patients. Then here's just showing that we can, some of these changes may be reversible or new changes may occur with vestibular rehabilitation. So these are patients who had vestibular migraine who successfully had, successfully had rehabilitation and showing that areas in the cerebellum were, were important um, correlates to the degree of uh, rehabilitation. Also, uh, persistent postural perceptual dizziness, 3PD, which is, has a lot of causes, one of which may be trauma. But there's been studies that show the decreased connectivity in, um, during task in different regions of the brain that are, again, related to the vestibular network. You can see areas like the PIVC listed there, the, again, the anterior cingulate cortex, 
Um, and then visual regions like the occipital cortex and regions we've seen uh, near B1. Um, this is just showing that there are some functional con uh, connectivity changes in 3PD as well. But I'm going to pass that for a second to talk about this next paper by uh, Richelli uh, from a few years ago, where they gave a task where they watched um, these uh, simulated uh, roller coaster rides and they compared the neutral. Uh, which would be kind of a horizontal, just going straight ahead, versus the vertical, where you can imagine a drop or an up uh, up a hill, which were more provocative to patients. And when they showed them these videos, they saw this region in the um, middle insula on the right that was selectively activated in patients with 3PD, and again also on the um, posterior visual cortex there, or the primary near the primary visual cortex um, on the left. And these were um, correlated with uh, symptoms, as you can see in the dizziness handicap index. There's also connectivity between uh, regions that are uh, involved in affect in patients. So this is on 3PD, and you can see um, regions that uh, are activated in the middle frontal gyrus and the occipital lobe that are correlated with um, affect such as neuroticism. And you can see on the right, this is functional connectivity with things like the Beck anxiety index and the Beck depression index. And I'm going to actually pass through a couple of these slides because I see that I'm a little bit behind. And I'm going to come to a little bit of my work. So we gave um, patients, we showed them videos in a magnet that were, uh, these are patients who have post-concussive vestibular dysfunction that were either neutral with no motion or have a lot of motion that's shown there down on the right. And you can see, we also see a selective activation in these patients in the region of the PIVC there on the right, as well as a couple of other regions. And we didn't see any areas of decrease activation. And these areas were uh, correlated with here are the PIVC and MSO. Those were regions that showed up, as well as the VVMCZ, showing that visual vestibular task localization is um, also important. And with that, I'm just going to jump to my last slide, which is my summary slide. So we're going to go through a couple of these right here. And just to let you know that, so uh, you can use both task-based and resting state fMRI to define the vestibular network. And this is a complicated network that has affect involved in it, as well as visual and uh, primary processing. And that both peripheral and central vestibular disorders actually re result in rewiring of these. So even acutely, like we saw in vestibular, uh, acute vestibular neuritis, we can get rewiring. And that we need to have future studies to better define these networks um, and, and include a lot more inputs as the work that I'm currently working on. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop. And again, thank um, some of my collaborators that you can see here. And um, we'll move on to questions. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Well, thanks to all of our panelists for an absolutely fantastic presentation. Um, I, I was just uh, blown away by some of the level of detail that Dr. Amons was able to show in understanding what actually generates sound with pulsatile tinnitus. Um, Dr. Sephardi had a, a fantastically clear explanation and detailed images of high drops with Meniere's disease. And Dr. Allen's peeking under the hood to show us what's really going on with uh, central vestibular disorders. Um, we had quite a lot of questions go in, uh, come in. Um, I had some of my own as well. So we're just going to start at the top and see how many we could get to uh, before they hit the gong and we need to close out this session. Um, so starting uh, with Dr. Amons, um, Dr. Flattery asked, how long do you require patients to be on blood thinners once the stent has been placed? Yeah, so our protocol is we put patients on aspirin and Plavix for a week ahead of time. And we use aspirin and Plavix daily for six months, at which point we stop the Plavix. We continue the aspirin for a full year and stop it at the end of the year. Gotcha. Um, Dr. Uh, oh, uh, did I see him drop out there? Um, you know what? I'm going to ask a question next to Dr. Sephardi then, and then we'll come back to the questions for Dr. Amons. Um, Dr. Sanjay Bansali for Dr. Sephardi, what Tesla strength MRI is required to see these detailed images? So a uh, three Tesla MRI is necessary, but not sufficient. Um, and these are noisy images, so you really need to get as much signal as possible. So it's got to be 3T. 
But these um, sequences are not plug and play vendor standard sequences. The protocol needs to be set up properly and not every scanner can necessarily accomplish it. So yeah, that would be 3T at minimum. Gotcha. Um, and then uh, another follow-up question for you then. Um, Dr. Hamid Jalilian asks, have you looked at patients with only cochlear symptoms? So clinical cochlear high drops, no vestibular symptoms. Uh, sure, I reviewed the literature on this and uh, the group at UCLA subsequent to me leaving there did actually publish the series of these and they found that in patients with cochlear high drops only, um, they had a hearing fluctuating hearing loss, um, oral fullness, um, you know, tinnitus, but they didn't have vertigo. So, um, you know, they uh, postulate that it is a distinct, uh, distinct clinical syndrome from Meniere's disease. Okay. And while I got you, I think I'm going to close out a couple more questions for you and then go back to Dr. Hamans. Um, so what is your experience with the presence or absence of high drops in patients with definitive vestibular migraine? Uh, we imaged a lot of those patients while I was at UCLA. We never um, compiled all of them into a series, but my experience with it was that we definitely saw high drops in those patients more than, you know, quote, control. And I'll get to the control question in a, in a moment. Um, but it wasn't necessarily very frequent. I would say it was like 20% or less um, as an estimate. And then uh, we have also uh, published a few case reports here and there of uh, delayed endolymphatic high drops or endolymphatic high drops complicating uh, vestibular Meniere's disease without all of the full um, without all the full features of the syndrome. Yeah, um, we have uh, more of a comment from Dr. Carey. Uh, great talk, thanks. Up to sixty percent high drops in contralateral ear and Meniere's disease is similar to physiologic findings, um, meaning abnormal vent tuning in the contralateral ear per Rausch et al. So it may not be a problem with imaging as much as with our understanding between the relationship between high drops and symptoms. Uh, sure, I'm really glad that that question was asked or the comment was made because I'm 100% sure that it is a problem with the imaging and some of the other studies. And the reason why is that a lot of these initial studies that talked about this sky high rate of contralateral high drops have no control group. Every single patient that they image is somebody who has Meniere's disease or close to it. Now at UCLA, the protocol that we had for imaging these patients had an ultra high resolution uh, T2 space that was essentially 100% sensitive for a vestibular schwannoma. So uh, we felt confident doing this protocol to rule out an acoustic in people who had um, sensory neural hearing loss, but no other symptoms of Meniere's. And imaging a lot of those patients, I think, gave us a really good kind of database of what normal should be. Because if you have a patient with unilateral idiopathic hearing loss, you have their affected ear and their contralateral ear. There's no reason whatsoever to suspect anything in their contralateral ear. So you get a couple hundred of this is what a normal ear should be, and you learn what that is. And then when you go back and you look at your Meniere's patients, the patients with unilateral Meniere's have a totally normal other ear, at least with respect to the question of high drops, you know, the vast majority of the time. I would say about 20% of the time there is contralateral high drops in somebody without contralateral symptoms, but it's nowhere near 65%. And I really do think that that's a reflection of um, kind of uh, poorly defined standards for how to call it or limitations in the imaging technique uh, in some of those earlier studies. Super interesting. And let me give you one final question. How often did you see endolymphatic sac dilation associated with cochlear high drops? Uh, that's a good question. One of the unfortunate things about this technique is that we're not really able to image the endolymphatic sac well. The endolymphatic sac is not bathed in perilymph. Uh, you know, it's just sitting there in a groove against the temporal bone. So we don't have that uh, kind of contrast that lets us uh, you know, see it. It just sort of blends into the adjacent CSF. So we're really not able to image it, unfortunately. Gotcha. And that, that last question was from Dr. Sajabi, by the way. Um, okay, I'm going to turn back to Dr. Amens um, and ask a question from Dr. Sismanis. What's your longest follow-up for stenting? Yeah, the first patients were stented probably 16 years ago. Uh, personally, my longest follow-up is six years. And it really seems to be that once we get outside of a year, uh, delayed recurrence is incredibly rare.
Um, a question for you from Dr. Quartler, um, and uh, it's a longer question, so you may have to just give us the, uh, you know, the two minute or the, the, the quick uh, snippet here. What is your imaging algorithm for patient with pulsatile tinnitus? Uh, that's a good question. We're going to publish a paper on this and the, the reasoning behind all of it. Uh, we're an MRI-based group, uh, so we do anatomical imaging. Uh, we do blood flow imaging. We look at the arteries and we look at the veins. Uh, but everything focused on the head and the neck, and uh, it's basically MRI-based. And then there's a question from Dr. Sajadi, and I might actually steal this one just because uh, Dr. Amons and I work together. Um, the question was, do you include any workup for patchless eustachian tube and vestibular migraine causing pulsatile tinnitus? And I think the answer for Dr. Amons is yes, he'll refer the patients to me as part of our multidisciplinary team uh, to uh, think about those etiologies. Um, and then we have a very interesting question from Dr. Della Santina, uh, who notes, thanks for the great talk. In theory, one could also relieve stenosis by surgically removing bone over the superficial wall of the transverse sinus. It seems risky, especially for a dominant side sinus, but do your model suggest that just bone removal over the transverse at the area of stenosis would be efficacious? Well, I got to be honest, I haven't thought about that before. Uh, the, the transverse sinus is a triangle in cross-section, and the stenosis is really indenting the two other limbs. So the lateral triangle is like the periosteum, and the inner portions of the triangle are dura mater, and it's the dura mater section that is pressed in that's causing the stenosis. It's not the bone moving anteriorly into the sinus that's causing the stenosis. So I don't know that actually removing the... The cortex would provide the result that we're looking for. We really need to move the dura mater anteriorly to get it out of the way. Gotcha. Um, and then let me ask a question to Dr. Allen next. Um, this is from Dr. Habib Rizek at MUSC. Um, the question is, since the magnetic field can stimulate directly the ampulla of the semicircular canals and cause vertigo, um, and, you know, I think Dr. Ward has done a, a lot of work on that and the Lorenz force is generated from the utricle as well. Um, how certain can we be that the findings are strictly due to the pathology we are studying versus stimulation of the peripheral vestibular system by the magnetic field of the MRI? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And um, kind of I'll answer in two parts quickly. Uh, since I already went over. But the uh, on the resting state side, uh, what we can do is we can position the patient's head in the scanner so that the uh, they line up um, and cause minimal, if any, stimulation. The, the difficulty with that is it's usually more of an uncomfortable position for the patient with their head tipped backwards and also does not usually allow for task fMRI at the same time. So how I deal with the, the task side in my work is that um, I'm using two different uh, stimuli, right? And we're subtracting them. So um, their baseline, if they're getting activation of the, uh, the peripheral vestibular system, it gets kind of washed out because you're looking at what happens between when I have, say, watch a video uh, that's provocative or watch a video that's neutral. And when you subtract those, the rest of the baseline kind of activation would kind of go away in that point. And then the final thing that we find is that a lot of the uh, activation we see correlates directly with symptoms outside of the scanner, suggesting that, um, you know, there is a direct correlation. And part of their problem may be increased sensitivity to these type of uh, changes uh, driving it. So um, those are kind of the short uh, or the long answer, but um, basically if it's resting state, you can actually overcome by positioning the head and, and don't get vestibular stimulation. Okay. Um, I think that probably is our time for this session. Um, so I just want to, um, oh, do we have a little more time? Okay, then I will ask another question then. No, no, I'm being told not really. <laughs> I'm going to end the session um, and just thank our wonderful panelists and my uh, co-moderator, uh, Dr. Vivas, um, and thanks to everyone for sticking around till the end of the day. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Well, that was an incredible day. Um, really, thanks to uh, uh, putting on a great panel there at the end. And 
and really, um, you know, when I look out across the, the whole two days, it was really a fantastic day. Thanks to everyone's contributions, uh, panelists, moderators. I know we all learned an awful lot about our field. I mean, think about it, cochlear implants, acoustic tumors, facial paralysis, stereotactic radio surgery, third windows, and then this incredible imaging panel at the end, and of course, COVID. So a big, big congratulations to our two award recipients for their fantastic research. Um, obviously, if this meeting is any indication, neurotology is alive and well. Um, our field is, is doing great things. Um, one important thing regarding CME, uh, look for an email on Monday um, coming from the ANS, and um, uh, that'll tell you how to, how to get your CME. Um, I just wanted to make a, a just uh, talk about our, our newly elected um, executive committee. I don't know if there's a slide for that, uh, Neil. Yeah, there you go. So uh, president for this next year is Fred Talishi, um, and our president-elect is Elizabeth Toe. Um, Secretary Treasurer will be uh, David Haynes. Um, Education Director will be Yuri Agarwal following Howard Francis. Um, diversity and Inclusion will continue to be chaired by Stephanie Moody Antonio. Uh, members at large will be Hussam El Kashlan, Sarah Mowry, and Alan Miko. So a big congratulations to that, uh, that group for their uh, commitment to the society. Um, a couple of other thanks as we wrap up here. Thanks to, to Neil and his group, um, the great uh, people from DigiMentors who really um, put on a fantastic production over these couple of days. They're the behind the scenes people that nobody really gets to see, but uh, it's a it's an incredible juggling act when you sit backstage and watch what goes on. So um, a big thanks to you all. Um, thanks to Howard Francis and the Education Committee uh, for all their input and in putting on a great uh, program. Um, a big thanks uh, to um, uh, Elizabeth Toe, as well as Ashley Eikenberry and Kristen uh, Bordignan for um, really um, running this entire organization and keeping everything uh, going in the right direction, especially working on logistics for these meetings. Um, these meetings and everything we do as an organization wouldn't be possible really without any of their hard work and dedication. So, and thanks to you all for your interest and engagement and constant support and feedback and um, importantly, and hopefully we uh, look forward to seeing everybody in the spring, um, uh, hopefully in person at COSM. And I hope you all have a safe rest of your weekend. So take care and good afternoon.